I used to spend a lot of time at my grandma's house. She didn't quite raise me, but with how often my mom was in and out of jail at rehab, she may as well have. That's not to say my childhood was bad, though. Maybe it wasn't as good as some had, but I got to spend a lot of time with my cousins when they visited. The house was in a beautiful spot on the edge of the woods, and Grandma really knew how to cook. I enjoyed my childhood, and no one can take that away from me. In fact, I really only had one truly bad experience in the years that I spent at my grandma's house. The day started out better than most. It was in the early summer, so I was out of school, and the days hadn't gotten unbearably hot yet. My two cousins, Thomas and Isabel, had spent the previous night at grandma's with me. We woke up all strung out on the couch in the family room, because we had stayed up the night before watching a bunch of old movies. After a hearty pancake and sausage breakfast, we went to the pool and then back to the house to play near the woods. That's when Grandma started calling for us from the back deck. She chastised us for leaving VHS tapes all over the family room floor and not cleaning up after ourselves. Can't we clean up after our game? We pleaded. I'm going out to drop off some things at your grandfather's work, and then I'm going to the store for supper ingredients. If I get back and that room isn't clean. We know, Grandma, we called back. She clicked her tongue at us but smiled and walked to the car. I don't remember all the games we were playing, only that my younger cousin Isabel stopped wanting to participate because we were spending too much time in the woods. They weren't scary or anything. The coniferous forest was always magical to me. In the autumn, the woods were filled with pine cones and acorns for me to collect. In the spring, it was populated by herds of young white-tailed deer. And especially in the winter, the snow coverage made my grandma's backyard look like the cover of a Christmas CD. Isabel loved the woods as much as Thomas and I did. But for some reason today, she kept her distance. Regardless of her hesitation, we would have headed in anyway because soon dark gray clouds began to roll in from the hills. The water droplets began to cover the windows as we shuffled through the piles of VHS tapes that we had left on the floor. We hadn't watched most of them the night before, but like young kids do, we had taken a bunch out and left them scattered, looking for the ones that we could agree upon. Isabel was only five and couldn't really read yet, so it was up to Thomas and I to match most of the tapes to their proper cases. In case you didn't grow up around them, most of the VHS tapes were black. That was the standard color. Occasionally, there would be some with the top strip of a different color, and even rarer were the fully colored ones that we had. I say this not just to recall a bit of nostalgia from an age of simpler tech, but also to highlight why what happened next was so strange. You see, with how rare colored VHS tapes were, we knew exactly which ones we had. Two orange ones and a blue one. Ironically, the blue one was in Blue's Clues. That was one of the orange ones along with Rugrats. The blue one was Monsters, Inc., but that afternoon as the storm really started to lay in thick and the view out of the windows was obstructed and near completely, Isabel handed me a tape and asked me which one it went to. I was confused not only because I had never seen the dark red VHS tape before, but because the writing on the front was something that I couldn't read. Hey Thomas, check this out. Can you read it? And Thomas looked as confused as I was. Indeed, and neither of us had remembered ever seeing the VHS before, and we wouldn't have forgotten such a distinct hue. Thomas assured me I wasn't crazy and that the writing on the tape couldn't have been English. We decided that we would watch it to figure it out. Although she denied it, we figured Isabel had just gotten another VHS tape off the shelf when we weren't looking and liked the color of it. Thomas popped the tape into the player and I turned on the TV. At first, we thought that it didn't work. The screen was just black with the exception of the text on the edges of the screen, which suggested the tape was homemade. 
All the letters were in that weird writing now, one that I was certain didn't even share the same alphabet as English. We were about to take it out when I noticed the numbers in the timestamp were going up, meaning that it was working and whoever had filmed the video was only filming in the dark. It's probably some old home movie grandma recorded and just left the camera going overnight or something. Why would it be written like that though? Maybe we should just rewind it to find out. I agreed with Thomas that rewinding the tape made the most sense. I hit the button on the player and went to sit back on the couch next to my cousins. I had expected the tape to take a while to rewind considering the working theory was grandma leaving the camera on overnight. But not long after I settled in, I heard the distinctive click of the tape reaching the beginning. And Thomas and I shared a confused look as I got up again to press play. The first scene was of the ground on the edge of the highway. Whoever was recording was clearly walking down the road. My suspicions that they were hitchhiking were confirmed as the next scene came up of the cameraman getting into the cab of a long-haul semi-truck. The trucker looked into the camera and smiled. He was an older man with a salt and pepper beard and a healthy sized pot belly. I'm making a documentary or something. Something like that. Was the first thing that we had heard the cameraman say. The tone was cheery like he was clearly obliged to finally get off his feet and into a vehicle. He also had an accent belonging to somewhere that my fourth grade mind couldn't place. The scene continued with the cameraman and the trucker having a friendly conversation. The cameraman placed the camcorder on the dash of the truck, pointed out onto the highway ahead of them. It didn't take long for us to get bored at this and I decided to fast forward the tape. The scene lasted for some time, and I watched the sun on the horizon dip below the tree line, and the cool evening sky take place on the screen. And then the camcorder began to shift and I stopped the rewind. The camera turned to film the trucker as he walked into a gas station in the middle of nowhere. Or so I thought. Hey, that's that truck stop on the edge of town, Thomas said. I looked more closely and realized that he was right. It was the truck stop a few miles out of town that grandma would always stop at to fill up and get snacks whenever we would go on road trips. As soon as the trucker got into the shop, the cameraman began to search through his belongings. He unzipped duffel bags and opened up shelves, pocketing random things as he went. I hurried to sit back down on the couch next to my cousin so that I could get a better angle of the screen. It wasn't long before we heard a, what's going on from the screen? The trucker had returned and wasn't happy to see what his guest was up to. A skirmish broke out between the cameraman and the trucker. At least, that's what I gathered, as the camcorder was dropped almost immediately. So all I heard was the noise of a brawl as the screen showed the dusty underside of the passenger seat. The sounds of the fight went from unnerving to disturbing quickly. Neither was screaming or yelling anymore, but one was unmistakably choking gasping for air and struggling to breathe. The screen began to shake to the rhythm of one of the men kicking the passenger seat and clinging on to a hope of life. Isabel grabbed my hand and whispered, I'm scared. It's okay, I assured her, not very assured myself. It's just a scary movie, it's not real. Isabel buried her face in my side and I welcomed the contact. I grabbed Thomas's hand and squeezed. We shared a look that signaled what we both knew. If this was a horror movie, why was that the truck stop that we knew so well? The noises on the screen stopped. Isabel began to lift her head to look again, but I held her head in place. The cameraman fished the camcorder from under the seat and pointed it straight at the lifeless truck driver. Thomas and I screamed. He lay awkwardly on the mattress of the cabin. His face was purple and his eyes were bloodshot. And then the camera turned. And for the first time we saw the identity, or lack thereof, of the man behind the film. He wore a wooden face mask. It was fashioned to look like an old man with a big bulbous nose and sad wrinkled eyes. 
Gray yarn was attached all around it to give the impression of long disheveled hair and a matching beard. The scene caught. Now it was nothing but trees. Isabel asked us what happened, but we didn't speak. She fought me to see the screen again, and this time I didn't resist her. Trees, and nothing but trees and dirt, and then it hit me. It was all too familiar. The grass, the trees, the pine cones and acorns. It was the woods behind the house. My gaze darted out the window to the tree line. The heavy rainfall distorted the forest. What I once considered to be a wonderland was now a mystery. And then I heard Grandma, but not from the front door, not from the hallway, from the screen. Thomas gripped my hand so tightly that it hurt. Isabel began to tear up. I'm going out to drop off some things at your grandfather's work. My heart dropped. The camera's point of view was from the woods looking into the backyard. It focused on the deck where my grandma spoke to us and then panned down to show me. My heart began to race as I saw the back of my head on the TV in front of me. Thomas stood next to me and Isabel. She looked right into the camera. She looked confused as if she didn't know what she was seeing. On screen, Thomas and I began to play tag, and I witnessed the moment in my life I came closest to death. As I ran from Thomas, I ran right past the cameraman who moved the camcorder to follow my path. My heart was louder than the screen. My throat was so tight that I almost couldn't breathe. And then the cameraman began to move. Not towards us, but towards the house. He filmed as he made his way right into the family room. He filmed the VHS tape sprawled along the floor and chuckled. And then my grandma came back into the house forgetting something. And the man darted into the closet to hide. Thomas, I whispered. He looked at me and the same realization dawned on me. The screen was black. The same black screen that we saw when we first put the tape in. But worse than that, the closet that he hid in was the same one that I had been standing next to so many times today. Every time that I got up to rewind or fast forward, I was only feet away. Thomas and I looked over at the closet now, and we saw the door ajar. And in the darkness, a wooden nose and frayed a gray yarn. All I remember was screaming and running as fast as I could with Isabel and Thomas next to me. We hurried up to the second floor and then into the attic. We hid away in a crawl space and prayed the man wouldn't find us. After what felt like hours, we heard footsteps. The creak of movement of the old wooden stairs. I closed my eyes and sobbed. The door to the crawl space opened and we all screamed. What has gotten into you three? Asked my grandma. And the whole world came back. We stumbled over our words explaining it to her. But I doubt she understood. But she took our testimony seriously. Grandma opened the gun safe and pulled out one of her husband's rifles. Stay here and I'll be back. It didn't take her long. Once she was sure that nobody was in the house, she got us and had us recall our story on the couch of the family room. I think she believed us, but the police couldn't do anything. The closet was open, but there was no man in a wooden mask. A dark red VHS tape wasn't in the player, and no trace of him was found in the woods. It took a while, but life returned to normal. School was back in session before I knew it. Homework began to take more importance in my mind than that afternoon. Pretty soon it felt surreal and as I got older I began to doubt if what we saw was even real. Only three things told me that it was though. Isabel and Thomas had recalled the exact same scenario that I had. When we got older my grandmother had admitted that a murder had taken place at the truck stop not long before the incident and the third thing happened most recently. I have it again. I'm now older and I live alone in a different town but just this afternoon I got it. Outside of my door was the same dark red VHS tape. I have called the police and in the meantime I sit here writing this story down while simultaneously looking behind my back every few seconds. And at the same time I can't help but glance at the old VHS player on my TV stand. I don't know if I should watch the tape.
The last few days have been busy to say the least. I guess I'll start with some extra information which I originally didn't think was relevant. My grandparents' house and the house that I live in now are both in the state of Alaska. I won't say the exact year that the original red tape incident had happened, but I will tell you that it was during the 2000s. My grandparents live in the same house. Both are healthy enough, save for the years of chronic back problems that recently put my grandpa in a wheelchair for most of the day. Thomas and Isabel, who I now realize I shouldn't have named in my first post, moved to Washington State back in high school. Come to think of it, that would have been about 10 years ago now. It's crazy how time flies. Anyway, keep these in mind while I tell the rest of my story. Right after I posted, I took a picture of the tape and I sent it to a group chat that I created with myself, Thomas and Isabel. Underneath the picture, I texted, Hey guys, I know I know, kind of Dom playing it right, but sue me, okay, I wasn't thinking clearly. And then I waited for the police to show up to my house. I kept my grandpa's old hunting rifle, a different one from the one my grandma had in the last post, but by my side the whole time. Eventually, I gave in to my morbid curiosity. I put the tape into the old VHS player that I kept from my grandparents' house. As the machine slowly came to life, I dug my fingernails into my palms. Nothing. Just a black screen, but this time with no texture on the sides. I grabbed the remote and rewound and fast-forwarded. Nothing ever came up. As I stared and mesmerized at the empty screen, a sudden noise made me jump. The sound of a notification from the group chat. It was from Isabel who was, probably rightly so, freaking out. She asked a hundred questions and I tried to answer as many as I could. And did you call the police? Yes. Did you watch the tape? Yes. What was on it? Nothing. Nothing? Yeah, nothing at all, I told her. I ejected the tape to get a better look at it. I focused on the writing. As a child, it was an enigma. As an adult, it was Cyrillic. I got back on my laptop and opened up a Word document and used the insert character tools to painstakingly draw out the characters. Once they were all correct, I copied and pasted the characters into Google Translate. After about five minutes of sleuthing, I uncovered it. The strange, eerie writing that had haunted me for so long. It simply said, The Red Tape. Very useful, I thought, more than a little exasperated. And then came the knocking at my door. I was frozen until I heard the voice call. Hello, are you inside? It's the state troopers. Uh, badge number, I stammered. What's your badge number? He rattled off a number along with the name Jay Serrano. I was about to open the door when I realized. I have a gun, I'm holding it, just for protection. It's Alaska, just don't point it at me and we're fine. I opened my front door to a young male cop with short brown hair. He looked through the house, checking every possible hiding spot that I could think of. He found nothing and was clearly annoyed by the task. Look, there's nobody around, okay? You sure it's not just a family member messing with you? My expression must have been enough of an answer for him. Okay then, I take it you want to go to the station and report it then, huh? Yeah, I would like to. I'll go away to my SUV then. If you're adamant about keeping your firearm on you, which it looks like you are, then just take that truck you have out there. He walked down my steps towards his squad car. I slung the rifle over my shoulder and went back into the house to grab a few things. My laptop, which I put in its case. The VHS tape, which rattled from old age and the VHS player. Just before I left the house, I had an epiphany. I rummaged through my junk drawer until I found a roll of scotch tape. I locked the door and I left. Only one other cop was at the station. According to them, they were two of the three in the whole backwater town that I lived in. The older, heavier cop was about as useful as his colleague. I had to insist they swab the VHS for fingerprints. They found none. 
I had to insist that they play through the tape. It was still black. As I pulled the rattling plastic case from the player that I had brought along, I lamented my utter inability to do anything, to even get a single sympathetic response. Look, I appreciate that it's a little spooky, said Officer Al Henton, but this is the middle of nowhere, Alaska. I'm sure you'll be fine. My eyes shot daggers at the older cop who hadn't once left his seat except to refill his coffee, especially given your rather Second Amendment-like tendencies. He added while gesturing towards my rifle in the corner, the one that I had insisted on keeping near me. Despite their apathy, I managed to have them record my name and number before I left the little rinky-dink police station behind. The whole drive through the evergreen highway back to my home, all I could think about was why that man in the wooden mask would leave behind the VHS tape with nothing on it. Was it just to mess with me? Why would he wait nearly 20 years to do so? These thoughts kept swarming my head as my ranger's tires crunched over the gravel that was my driveway. I took another look at the tape sitting on my passenger seat. My eyes rested on it for several seconds. At the handwritten Cyrillic and the faded deep red plastic. And then I grabbed my rifle from the gun rack and pointed the scope at my door. Everything was normal save for one discrepancy the small piece of scotch tape that I had left in the top corner, a small transparent seal bridging the door in the frame. It was loose. Back into reverse, back down the evergreen highway and into the nearest motel that I could find. There, I unpacked my VHS player and my laptop. As I made sure to double lock the door and double check the parking lot for anything strange, I finally relaxed. I pulled up my cell phone to see the group chat that I had ghosted was full of messages from both Thomas and Isabel. I reassured them that I was okay but also told them that the police were going to be no use. Thomas asked me what grandma and grandpa thought of it. I had to admit that I hadn't called them. Don't you think you should? Isabel messaged as I finished plugging the cords from my player into the motel television. Luckily, the motel hadn't updated their entertainment since the Clinton administration. Yeah, maybe they know something about the last time that they never told us, Thomas added. I'll call them in a bit, I assured. I want to figure out this tape first so they don't freak out over something that we have no answers to. And then I reached for the tape and for the final time that day, I heard it rattle. A rattle. I shook the tape. So many VHS tapes had developed rattling noises when they got old, maybe from broken plastic or even dead bugs inside. But this rattling was different, it was heavier. Guys, I think there's something inside the tape. What? What's inside the tape? I don't know, should I open it? The answer was a resounding yes. The only issue was that the VHS case had small screws in each of the corners that I had to get out before opening the shell, and since they were too small to unscrew with the blade of my pocket knife, I needed to get my Swiss army from the ranger's glove box. Slowly I crept out of the motel room. I scanned every window of the building as I made my way to the red ranger in the lot. Luckily nothing seemed to be off. I managed to get back into the room with no issue. Did you open up the VHS yet? No, I just got back into the room, opening it now. It's... it's a USB drive. Hesitantly, I plugged the drive into my laptop. I crossed my fingers and hoped that maybe this was an elaborate scheme to put a virus on my computer. I opened the file manager and saw the USB tab simply titled that same phrase, the red tape. There was nothing but a video file. A video file in English which said... Two, and then to my grandfather's name. I didn't want to open the video. I wanted to close the laptop and throw it out and move away. But seeing my grandfather's name and not knowing what his connection was to the man in the wooden mask, I needed to know. My media player popped up. The video was that same familiar black screen with these Cyrillic text borders. And then it was the same road, the same highway 
small rocks and tufts of dry pine. A simple rustic highway that nevertheless filled me with dread. Making a documentary or something, asked the soon-to-be-dead trucker. I witnessed his lifeless purple face again, and then for the first time in almost 20 years I saw that wooden mask, the frayed gray yarn, the carved wrinkled bags, the image that had haunted me ever since my childhood. But this time I looked deeper into the uncaring wicked soulless eyes of the man behind it. If I get back and that room isn't clean, said my grandmother, I watched with each passing scene slowly bringing the memories to life. The reality weighed heavy on my heart. Soon the screen returned to the black nothingness of the closet, but this time there was another scene. It began in the family room with the tapes all strewn about. A deep sinister chuckling sounded from behind the camera, then a phrase in Russian that I couldn't understand. Just then I realized that I could understand. I paused the video, trying not to worry too much about the timeline, which showed how much footage was left to show. I got out my phone and opened up Google Translate. I played the scene again, allowing my phone to listen. You see how easily they scare, old man. How easy this will be. I wish that I hadn't translated it. The video continued to play. The man in the wooden mask searched through the rooms. The dining room, the laundry room, my bedroom. But before he could get to the second floor, the sound of the front door opening had scared him away. He ducked into a corner as my grandmother went to the family room to see tapes all around. Where are you kids? I heard her yell as the cameraman snuck out. But instead of darting to the woods, instead of leaving the property, he went immediately into the garage. A clutter-filled garage tucked away under the dock, one that we rarely ever entered because of the darkness and the crowdedness, a garage which offered so many places to hide. The screen went black again. It was spliced with modern footage, a couch in the center of a cabin, and then the cameraman walked from behind the tripod and took a seat on the couch. He stared into the lens, his face still covered with the rustic wooden mask. He spoke in Russian at first. Before I could get my phone back out to translate, he switched to English. Now this is for the grandchild, he said. Your granddaddy wants to ignore me. He wants to forget what he left behind. But I don't forget and I won't be ignored. If your cowardly old man refuses to see me, then I'll have to come visit you, and I won't be so nice this time. The video ended. I sat there stunned. A million questions flew through my head. I didn't have any answers, but I knew where to start. I pulled up my contacts and went to call the people that I should have called to start. But just before I could place the call, I heard a loud, hard knocking at my motel door. I set my phone down. I stood still as a statue until the knocking sounded again, this time heavier, this time angrier. With a wary heart and a shaky hand, I looked through the peephole and saw those same soulless eyes looking in. I backed away. I darted for my rifle that rested on the moose print patterns of the bed. As the relentless pounding got heavier and heavier and the hinges vibrated and weakened, I aimed the barrel straight at the center waiting for the man in the mask to appear. And then I realized if I was going to make it out, I had to keep the evidence, and I couldn't let it disappear again. Only the footage would make the state troopers take me seriously. I pocketed the USB drive just as the sound of shattering and cracking wood filled the room. Only for a moment I saw a sledgehammer head being pulled from a freshly made hole in the door. And then I saw the man in the wooden mask look through and wave, tauntingly and menacingly cheerful. I tried to yell to stand my ground, but my voice wouldn't catch. He reached his arm through the hole where the handle had been and undid the deadbolt and chain. Still, I stood frozen. Gun held high, but too in shock to fire. 
he opened the door and stepped inside. His massive figure was accentuated by a thick brown coat and heavy steel toe boots. In his hand, he dragged the long wooden shaft of an old, rusty sledge. I will shoot, I managed. Shoot me, he said, his voice completely calm. Steady unlike mine, and though I had the better weapon, though the situation seemed in my favor, I felt utterly powerless. It was the demon who haunted my childhood, now back and in the flesh. My own personal boogeyman ready to finish the deed. Shoot me! He yelled as he swung the great hammer directly into the box television, which shattered glass all around. Electric sparks danced momentarily. Then came the deafening crack of my rifle. Cotton and feathers floated through the air. I took my chance to run past him, nearly being knocked down as he shoulder-checked me. Quickly down the rusted stairs, I got to my ranger, but my last bit of hope drained away as I saw the tires. They were slashed completely through, no chance of driving. That was a clever trick with the tape, he said, slowly making his way down the creaking iron steps. I underestimated you. I didn't respond except to chamber another round and send it straight into his chest. He stumbled for only a moment, but I took the chance and ran into the woods, nearly tripping on the evergreen roots and upturned mossy stones, but never slowing for fear of the man in the wooden mask. I ran and ran until finally the adrenaline failed to keep my legs from holding. They failed and I fell, gasping with lungs on fire and legs to match. On the damp, mossy ground of the forest, with rays of sunset beams leaking through the pines I laid, I caught my breath. The whole time I prayed and not to have a sledge come down into my skull. I had no willpower left to stop it. But nothing ever happened. For the moment, I was safe. The sun retreated from the sky and soon darkness surrounded me. As I finally regained the energy to stand, I reached for my pocket to grab my phone and... No! I screamed. As the yell echoed through the woods, I realized my error. Please don't let him be near, I thought. He must not have been because I survived the night. I slogged through the woods trying to find my way, but not wanting to go deeper into the vast Alaskan wilderness. Eventually, as the last glimpses of daylight disappeared from the forest... I settled down under a lone spruce. I rested, thankful that the night was warm at least. And despite my best efforts, despite my desperation and horror, I slowly slipped away to sleep. The songs of the birds woke me. I rubbed my eyes as the morning sun warmed my face. That same eastern sun I used to retrace my tracks, to navigate my way to a road that thankfully I recognized. I followed it, but not in the open, keeping it just in view as I hiked through the trees. Worried the man might take the highway in search of me, I wandered, but I never saw him. As my worry for my own safety began to lessen, my worry for that of my grandparents grew. My gut pained with the thought of what I might come across when I arrived. How slowly I traveled, how much time the man had to get to them before I... My regret that I hadn't informed them sooner deepened. They had absolutely no idea who was out there. I prayed that Thomas or Isabel might have called in my steed when I had failed to answer their messages for so many hours. And then finally I saw the familiar scattered houses of my grandparents' small neighborhood. At nearly noon, I snuck my way through, holding my gun ready and looking constantly behind my back through the yard where I used to play and up to the rear door of the home. I was greeted with a shotgun pointed at my face, one that lowered and just as quickly as it was raised. It was Thomas. Where have you been? We thought you were dead, we thought. He was interrupted by his sister who pushed him aside to embrace him. Oh, thank God you're okay, said Isabel. They told me about how they had immediately booked flights from Seattle when I failed to answer them. How they called grandma when they landed and filled her in on everything they knew. 
They led me into the kitchen and then to the dining room, and there I found both of my grandparents. Their faces lit up as I entered. My grandmother hugged me and tripped over her well-meaning words. My grandpa, who was bound to his chair, simply said, Thank God, thank God. He looked though my grandmother still retained some of the deep amber locks of her youth among the greys. My grandfather's head was pure, snowy white. His large and bulky frame barely fit into his wheelchair. My grandmother grabbed me food and a drink to ease my hunger. As she did, I filled them in on what had happened, every detail, and when I got to the topic of the USB, my grandfather's face darkened. He said my name, didn't he? I nodded. I asked what the man wanted, but my grandpa only looked down at his rough and weathered hands. Eventually, he said to his wife, We have to tell them. We do not. Defined my grandmother as she rested a plate of maple bacon and golden hash browns in front of me. All we have to do is get them on a flight to Seattle. They shouldn't have come up to begin with. We'll send the other one with you. It's not safe for any of them. Like we're going to just stay behind while all of this is happening, interjected Tom. It's none of your business, Grandma demanded. She washed her hands in the sink and rubbed them dry in her apron. Like hell it isn't, I retorted. I've got two missing rounds that would beg to differ. We have to know what's going on. She didn't respond as she made her way to sit at the table next to my grandfather. He placed his large bear paw on her hand, a comforting gesture as it rested on the table. Fine, she said, pulling it away. Even though you promised me you would never speak of it. Circumstances, darling. Grandpa took another sip of his drink. He looked each of us in the eyes in turn, and then he said carefully, I am not who you think I am. We listened intently, myself as I filled my empty stomach and Thomas and Isabella as they stood by the wall. He told us so many things, so many incriminating things about who he was, what he did for work, about an illegal smuggling operation during the Cold War, how he worked with Soviets just across the Bering Sea to provide them with contraband that could only be found in the U.S., it was very lucrative, he continued, and I didn't feel any guilt. It wasn't anything illegal here. It was more movies and food, things the government in Russia didn't allow at the time. I sold it to them and they turned around and sold it to the citizens. Everything was good. Life was good for the first time and I could provide for my children. You have to understand I was a young man, a foolish man perhaps but I felt that I was doing good in a way. I justified it not just with the prospering of my family and the buying of this home, but with how the citizens of another nation, one who didn't allow them hardly any freedom, could benefit as well. And then the wall fell. Then the USSR fell. The trade had to change. The same old contraband wasn't enough. I saw his eyes sink into his coffee. I saw his lip begin to quiver. Drugs. I wasn't proud of it, but I did it. I wanted to keep providing for my family, for your father. He said to Thomas and Isabel, and your... But he couldn't finish the sentence. My mother, I choked. We both sat solemnly. We both understood the implications, the unintended consequences of his actions. It was too late to turn back when I found out. When I discovered your mother's addiction, an addiction that I caused. My grandmother stood behind him and put her arms around his shoulders. She ran them back and forth to soothe them. It was our greatest mistake, she said. As she kissed his white hair, she added, I blame myself too. I raised her. My grandfather continued as tears began to build. And I didn't see the signs. I should have never brought those drugs through here. Falling droplets hit the table. He managed to choke out. I killed my only daughter. Before he convulsed into a sobbing fit. He broke down. 
Isabel placed her hand gently on my shoulder, but I didn't react. As I watched my grandfather relive his greatest regret, as I watched the once powerful, jolly man who raised me, now an aged, crippled mourner, my mind couldn't take anything in. I couldn't understand the revelations presented to me. Was my mother's death really the cause of my grandparents, the ones that I had loved my entire life? I suddenly felt sick that I had resented her actions and her leaving me. Once he steadied himself and returned to his typical stoic demeanor, though one decorated with puffy red eyes, we continued. For some time we discussed it. I scraped at the empty ceramic of the plate, busy in my hands. I asked questions and they were answered. But by the end of the conversation, I still had no closure. How does any of this relate to the man in the wooden mask? I asked. A caught Nick, my grandfather said. The hunter. The name hung in the air after he spoke it. Me's the last one, he continued. My grandmother excused herself and went into another room. After I found out about your mother's disease, I tried to fix it. We sent her to rehab, we took you in, and I tried to get out of the game. Wow, well, the boys across the sea didn't like that so much. About six months after I stopped flying things over, they sent the hunter for me. Not to kill me, but to send a message. That's why he came to the house, said Thomas. No, that's not why. My grandmother re-entered the room. She had in her hands an old rolled up newspaper. I had to end it. It had to be done. Spread out over the stained mahogany tabletop, I read the words. Thirteen Russian nationals dead after warehouse explosion. No way, Thomas muttered. That was the only thing spoken for a moment as we took in this new information. Then Isabel broke the silence. I'm guessing Mask Face didn't like his whole crew going up in flames. Grandpa shook his head. That's when he tried to go after you three. I took his family, he'd take mine. But he didn't get to you. Maybe if he wasn't such a drama queen and just... I don't like to think about what could have happened. The risk that I put my loved ones through. So that's why he recorded it all, just to be dramatic? Thomas asked. I think he intended on filming it all, to the end and showing me the result. The grim revelation once again muted the room. But then why give up, I continued. Why only return after 19 years? Grandpa took a sip from his coffee mug. Uh, because I put him away. Fifteen years incarceration. I should have killed him, but I couldn't manage it. That's fifteen, Isabel said. Why well, wait another four? What makes now the time? My grandfather knocked three times on the arm of his wheelchair. We understood. Now was when my grandfather was weak. When he was vulnerable. Another three distinct knocks echoed from the front door. Thomas and I both grabbed our guns and followed my grandpa as he rolled over to answer. Officer, he said, what brings you here? My grandmother brought the grizzled Alaskan State Trooper a mug of hot coffee to match my grandfather's. His name was A.P. Cartwright. He must have been the third trooper the other two told me about. He retained a sense of skepticism given his colleague's level of professionalism but it slowly wore away as he talked. He spoke with an honest and serious cadence that reassured me that perhaps we had at least one ally. And that's when I arrived at the motel, saw the pickup in the parking lot, its tires were slashed, and I went into the room with the busted door. Did you get my laptop or my phone? I asked. He shook his head. All that was left was this. He pulled something from his bag and set it on the table the two plastic pieces of the VHS tape that I had disassembled. I went back to the station to see if those bozos knew anything about it. Said that you came by earlier. Said they took down your name and number and so I called. Some feller answered in Russian, hung up when I identified myself. I couldn't contact you but I recognized the last name so I chased that lead over here and that's that. 
Grandpa brought the tape closer to him for a better look. He chuckled to himself. What's the joke? asked the officer. My grandfather hesitated. Grandma placed her hand on his head, ruffling his gray hair. I guess it's time, he said. I'll be incriminating myself, but at least we'll all be on the same page. Maybe I can finally make my family safe. This writing says the red tape. Yeah, I translated it, I added. But what use is it just describing the VHS? No, 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 the red tape doesn't refer to this VHS. The red tape was the name of the smuggling group. It refers to the bureaucratic red tape that kept the Soviet citizens restricted from simple entertainment and other liberties. It was meant to remind them why they had started the group. Now the hunter uses it to remind me. To make sure that I don't forget. What group? Cartwright inquired. What hunter? He told the man everything. He told him about the hunter he told him about the incident and about everything since. Cartwright jotted it all down on his notepad. He asked questions when he could clarify. The more the scratching of the pencil to parchment continued, the more sure I was that A.P. Cartwright might be our saving grace. I moved here from Anchorage over 25 years ago, said the trooper. This is a quiet place, not much to do, except for a few years in when a murder took place in the outskirts of town. Few days passed but no leads. Trucker wasn't local, didn't have any connections in town and no reasonable enemies. Isabel grabbed my hand. It was a gesture the officer noticed from his periphery. He understood. It stumped me. Until a couple days later I responded to a call about a red VHS tape. A dead trucker and a man in a wooden mask. That was the three of you, wasn't it? We nodded solemnly. Cartwright shifted his attention back to his coffee and his cupped hands. He had a wife. The trucker, that is. I remember the way she cried when I called her. The sound of a heart shattering into a million pieces. For a long time afterwards, she called the station every day and I answered every day. Have you found the killer? Have you found him? Have you found him? He stopped speaking. He stared into the black of the coffee. I witnessed the ever so slight quiver of his lip before he continued. She didn't make it long. A few months in, she hadn't been making her usual calls to the station. Try to get a hold of her but it was pills. That's what she chose. No sound filled the room. A silence only broken from the faintest creak of an old shifting house. The hunter is relentless. My grandpa said after a while, he doesn't care who he hurts, he'll keep going unless we stop him. After a sip of black coffee, the grizzled vet said, If what you're saying is true, then I'm with you. We're gonna put that son of a gun down. Elation, that's the only way to describe how I felt. Finally, we had somebody who could really help. Someone who wasn't past his prime and bound to a wheelchair. Someone who wasn't completely out of their wheelhouse like the three of us. But how do we find him? Isabel asked. The message, I shouted. I remembered something my grandfather had failed to tell the trooper. Inside the VHS this time, there was this USB drive. I fished it from my pocket, thankful that at the very least I had managed to secure one thing of importance. What did it say? Cartwright inquired. It was the original tape. Only this time he spliced new footage at the end of him talking to my grandfather. At first it was in Russian. I turned to my grandfather. Can you understand Russian? Been working with him since the Reagan era child, of course I do. He chuckled. I turned to my grandma and said, Sweetheart, would you grab the laptop so we can take a look? No! Thomas interjected, catching everyone's attention. I mean, not here. You said you put it in your laptop at the motel, right? Then by coincidence, the hunter shows up. How are we so sure that's not how he tracked you there? I thought it over for a moment. I hadn't considered that as stupid as it sounded. He could have just seen my truck out front. 
Maybe, but maybe he used it to find you. All I'm saying is maybe it would be better to watch it somewhere safer and more secure. And to the station then, Cartwright said. Smart thinking, son. We got into two separate cars. Thomas drove Grandma and Grandpa in their wheelchair accessible van. Isabel and I rode with Cartwright in his Alaskan State Trooper SUV. You said the man who answered the phone spoke in Russian, right? Asked Isabel from the back seat. The trooper nodded. That means at the very least, he pocketed your phone for a while. Yeah, I'm sure he wanted Grandpa to call me. That way they could talk or whatever. As I stared out the window to the trees, and his dark heavy clouds moved in, so similar to that afternoon so long ago, Isabel asked a question which brought us one step closer to finding our man. Did you leave your location on? The world outside was now dark and gray from the cloud cover. Soon it would begin to rain. We had all gathered in the large main room of the cabin turned police station. My family, Cartwright, and the other two less useful troopers. After cussing them out for a healthy amount of time, Cartwright told Serrano the younger one to grab his laptop from the office. While the younger trooper went off grumbling to do so, Cartwright relayed Isabel's realization to the group. So we can just track the phone, my grandfather asked. I explained to him that all I had to do was log into a website online and using that, we could get a GPS location of where the phone was. And where the phone is, maybe the hunter is, Thomas concluded. But what if he just ditched the phone? He might have, I reasoned, but maybe he doesn't know about it. I mean, he's been in prison for a long time, right? Technology has changed since then. I didn't know about it, Grandpa added, and I haven't even been to jail. If he knows, then he probably would have ditched it by now. If the phone isn't moving in the map, then that's probably what happened, I continued. But if it's on the move, then we'll be one step ahead of him, Thomas concluded. And with the numbers advantage and the arms advantage, this guy is toast, Cartwright assured. Serrano set down the bulky, out-of-date laptop on the round table that we had been sitting at. I logged into the website to find my phone. The marker on the map was still at the motel, which confused Cartwright. But he explained that he may have missed it, or that the hunter had dropped it somewhere nearby. I asked him when he called the number and when the man had picked up. Cartwright pulled up his phone log to be sure. And that wasn't too long after the incident. But why would he hang around the scene of the crime for so long? Maybe he didn't. Maybe he hung around in the woods, but just close enough to ambush you if you tried to come back. If you brought your grandfather along to help. Was nobody else at the motel? Isabel asked. I shook my head. It's not tourist season, and why else would anybody stay in this place? I had to call the owner and insist that he came down to give me a key. Waiting in the ranger was horrifying, but... Yeah, I called that guy. Cartwright interrupted, and then apologized for doing so. When I saw the motel and the wreckage as I drove past it, I told him to be careful but to get down there as quick as he could. We discussed the issue for a while longer, and then the problem of the flash drive was brought up. Should we watch it? Thomas and Isabel argued that even here wasn't secure enough to risk the hunter knowing our location. Grandma agreed. Grandpa wanted to hear what the hunter had to say, but eventually relented once he realized that he was alone in the matter. If we can catch this guy without playing his game, that's the best possible outcome. Cartwright reasoned. All his speech is going to do is rile us up and skew our mission. We have a good plan as long as he's held onto the phone. Now we just wait and see. The mood in the air never lessened. I felt the flash drive shifting in my pocket whenever I moved. Serrano took the opportunity to apologize to me for his behavior the previous day. He explained that in all his years of being in this town, nothing had ever happened. Mostly it was false reports and wasting time. Our conversation was interrupted when the older trooper captured everybody's attention. Uh, you might want to see this, Henton said. He turned the laptop to show us the marker on the GPS was now moving away from its resting spot and out of the highway. 
Guess he got sick of waiting. Henton, Serrano, you're both with me, demanded Cartwright. Suit up, full kids. We're getting this SOB and we're doing it quickly. He turned to the five of us. I can't have y'all coming with me, it's too dangerous. He received no complaint from us. Then he told Thomas, Isabel, and I to follow him deeper into the station. He unlocked a door to reveal a windowless room filled with guns and ammunition. I expect the guns back, he said. The bullets, though, those are for the hunter to keep. If he shows up. He winked at us and patted Thomas on the shoulder. We grabbed a rifle or a shotgun each. A handgun to match, including two for Grandma and Grandpa. While we shuffled through the boxes of ammunition to find the corresponding packages, Thomas chuckled. What's up? I asked, slipping some boxes into a large hiking backpack. You think this is the real reason that Gramps always took us out hunting? To make sure that we knew guns? I thought it over and found myself chuckling as well. As we unloaded all of the arms onto the large round table that we had gathered around earlier, Cartwright gave us some final words. The sun's going down, get some rest, but you might want to leave some lookouts awake. The cameras keep an eye all around the station. We left the door to the security room unlocked so that you can see the screens. I'm sorry we don't have any vests for y'all. Only got three and they're fitted for us. He looked around seriously at each of us. You cannot, let me stress this, you cannot be too careful tonight. Make sure someone has an eye on those screens at all times. Cartwright, I said just as he was about to walk through the door. I shot him two times straight in the chest and he kept walking. He nodded. He's probably wearing a vest under that coat of his. He barely even flinched though, and they weren't far away shots either. Virtually point blank. Rifle too. Just, just don't underestimate him. He nodded in agreement, and then with a casual salute, he was gone. They took each of their SUVs, leaving us with only the van at the edge of the dirt driveway. Thomas went over and deadlocked the front door. As he did, he looked out the window at the blackened sky and the blurry, concealed sun as it touched the tree line. It's starting to rain, he said. Drops of liquid soon decorated the glass panes as if to prove him right. The similarities to that first encounter with the hunter made my stomach uneasy. Could it be so easy? Would the three troopers catch the hunter by surprise? My mind went back to what the hunter said to me, what I had relayed to Cartwright. I underestimated you. Would he really underestimate us again? I pondered these questions as I helped my grandfather out of his wheelchair and into the bed of one of the rooms. The police station had it so that the troopers could stay overnight if needed. He cried in pain from the few steps to the bed. As he collapsed down, he laughed a little while blinking the tears from his eyes. It just occurred to me that I can finally tell you why I have all these back problems, he said. You told me that it was all those years with the oil company. I didn't lie, but that's not where it started. After that incident with the three of you and Okoknik, I tracked him down. We had a shootout and he got me right near the spine. Surprised he didn't paralyze me. Then once he was off to prison, I went back to working at the oil rig. Only the work was a lot harder. Too many years of that and well, I was really happy when I finally retired. He smiled at me brightly expecting a response. I didn't give one. After the story, I simply said goodnight and went to leave the room. On the way out, I passed my grandmother who was coming in. She placed a comforting hand on my shoulder, one that turned into an embrace. I sighed, said that I loved them, and went back to the main room with Thomas and Isabel. Do you forgive him? Isabel asked me from the leather couch that she rested on. It had been an hour of mostly silence. I stared through the open door to the room where my grandparents slept. The questions about my mother and how much of the blame was on my grandfather, they had been swirling through my head since Cartwright had left. I don't know, I said. I don't even know if I blame him in the first place. Maybe I do. 
I shifted my spot at the table and buried my head in my hands, deep in thought. I don't think I'll be able to make sense of it until the hunter is put away at least, and maybe not for a while after. My whole life I thought my mom was the one to blame. I thought grandma and grandpa were saints for taking me in. And that hasn't changed unnecessarily, Isabel said carefully. They did still take care of you, they did still help your mom go to rehab. She wouldn't have had to if grandpa didn't bring drugs to the town to begin with. After a moment, I sighed and lifted my head again. Before Isabel could speak, I said, I know, I know. He couldn't have foreseen what would happen. Even if he wanted to get out, it's not like it was easy. I mean, look where we're at now. You think those guys are going to get him? Thomas asked. He was just near enough to hear the conversation. Inside the security room with the door open, examining the screens. I looked down at the old laptop with the map pulled up. Cartwright had taken his phone with them. I logged into the website on that so that he could more easily track the hunter on the move. The marker had come to rest in a house on the edge of town. For a while, it continued to move around the vicinity, but now it had remained in one place. There's something moving on the screen, Thomas said. Isabel instantly shot up from her resting state. I took my attention away from the laptop. What is it? I'm not sure, just some moving in the bushes right now. It's really hard to tell with how dark the screens are. The two of us joined Thomas in the security room. He was right about the vision. Not only the darkness, but also the storm. Very little could be seen. And then just barely, we caught sight of it. And we each sighed in relief and shared some mild, awkward laughter at the sight of a cow moose. Isabel went to lay on the couch again after a while. She hadn't slept much on the plane ride and was exhausted. I kept Thomas company in the security room. We talked for the better part of an hour about everything that we can think of. The revelation of our grandfather's past. The refutation of all our ideas of imagined experiences and the realization that both of us were starving. And Thomas left the room to rummage through the fridge for something to eat. And that's when everything went to hell. Complete darkness filled the cabin. All of the security screens went black at once, the lights out, the open fridge and now dark. For a moment, neither of us reacted. And then we sprang into action, waking each of our sleeping family members. Confusion was the shared experience. Was it the storm, a simple yet terrifying coincidence? We each grabbed our guns. We each threw our bags of ammo over our shoulders. We mounted ourselves around the table as Grandma helped Grandpa to his chair. And then came the smell, a smoky scent that stung our nostrils. Fire, Thomas shouted. Sure enough, the walls of the hallway that led deeper into the cabin were lit by the crimson glow of open flame. As the wicked heat and smoke began to fill the main room, we panicked. We asked each other what to do and where to go. The sinking dread of realization that this could be no coincidence sank in. And to the van, Grandpa shouted over our yelling. We have to get to the van, go. Into the harsh rains we went. Thomas took the keys and ran through the mud to unlock the doors and turn on the vehicle. And then he stood guard, his gun held high and looking every which way. Isabel helped Grandma through the mud to the van where they began to lower the ramp. They yelled at me to hurry, but the thin wheels in my grandfather's chair digging deep into the slippery, sticky earth slowed me immensely. Leave me, he yelled. It's me that he wants. Just leave me. But I wouldn't. I dragged the chair behind myself as I plowed through the muddy driveway, and then a sudden cracking noise filled the air. It was not thunder. The sound was followed by a shrill and haunting screech, a scream which I will never forget. Isabel pulled Grandma into the van, and Grandma who laid on her lap a splotch of blood is spreading through her apron. My grandfather yelled and cried in a way that I had never heard before. With the adrenaline now at a peak, I was able to drag the wheelchair to the van. As Thomas shot into the woods, I shoved Grandpa's chair in, pushed the ramp up and closed the door and got in the passenger side. With his shotgun now empty, Thomas jumped into the driver's seat. 
he peeled away, kicking up mud and swerving his way out to the main road. I looked to the back seat to see my grandmother, thankfully still conscious. Grandpa held her hand and cried, completely unintelligible. Get to the hospital, I yelled. I prayed it would be enough. And Grandma tried to soothe us, though her voice was getting faint. Isabel ran her fingers through the copper and silver locks of her hair. For a moment, nothing at all existed as I watched the color fade from the woman who raised me. Thomas broke the trance with a yell. Behind us. I snapped my head to see through the mirror a pair of bright headlights quickly approaching. I pulled my handgun from its holster. Is it him? Isabel asked. She was answered by the sudden jolt of the van being slammed into by a heavy truck. I rolled down my window and leaned out with my gun drawn. I emptied the magazine towards the truck. A few shots hit the vehicle but most ricocheted off the wet asphalt of the highway. I pulled myself back into the van to reload. My hair was dripping from the downfall outside. The inside of the door was soaked and slick from being open so long in such a storm. Hey, drive steady, I said. I once again leaned out of the van, this time going so far as to sit on the windowsill and hold tightly onto the van's cargo bar to keep from falling. Hey, be careful, Thomas yelled as the truck veered off to the side. I saw the hunter driving. He wore his wooden mask even now. I steadied my gun at him just as he lifted his up to me. Two resounding shots rang out and two bullets landed. Both of us had missed our mark. The side mirror below me cracked and fell onto the road. The truck had decelerated rapidly. I had flattened one of the tires at least. I watched as the vehicle came to a stop and as the lights faded in the storm. I'll kill that son of a... I'll kill him. Grandpa yelled all the way to the hospital. We got there just in time. The few members of the medical staff in the building were able to steady Grandma's vitals. We'll have to life flight her to Anchorage. A nurse told us grandchildren just outside of the emergency room. Only one person can fit in the helicopter with her, considering how many of the medical staff needs to go with. We discussed it amongst the family and decided that Isabel should accompany her. The main reason being that Grandpa refused to leave town until the hunter was dead. The three of us watched from the rooftop as the helicopter took flight and slowly faded into the now rising sun as the clouds of rain dispersed. Then as we stood on the wet cement roof of the hospital, we saw the lights of three AST vehicles pulling into the parking lot. We met the three officers by the front door. I could tell them from the look on his face that Cartwright was utterly distraught. And before he could explain what had happened, Grandpa flew into a rage. Wheeling himself towards them, he screamed and cursed at the officers. He denounced them for failing to protect us, failing to protect my grandmother. As Cartwright's head hung low in despair, I couldn't help as my own emotions bubbled to the surface. No, you don't get to be angry. I shouted at the old man in the chair. None of this would be happening if it wasn't for you. You almost got us killed as children. You almost got my grandma killed. And you did kill my mother. All of us are here picking up after you. So don't just sit there useless while the rest of us try and fix it. Tears streamed down my face. I could hardly see. I could hardly think. And soon I could hardly speak. As my throat closed tight from emotion, as my tongue stumbled over the words, I gave up and turned away back to the van. I cried. I cried with my head hung low until I felt a hand touch my shoulder. I looked up to see Thomas. He said nothing. But through my tears, I saw that he was crying as well. I rested my head on his shoulder and he wrapped his arm around me. We didn't find the truck on the highway back to the station. The hunter must have thrown on a spare. I rode with Cartwright. I wanted to keep some distance from my grandfather. The whole drive back, Cartwright told me about what had happened after they had left to track the hunter down. The GPS led them to a house on the edge of town. They slowly surrounded it before knocking the front and back doors down. The house belonged to the motel owner. After talking to him for a while, they figured out what had happened. 
The hunter must have answered the phone while hiding inside of the office. The owner said that the door had been unlocked when they got there despite him always leaving it secured. Once the hunter realized that the police were involved, he slipped the phone into the pocket of a coat left behind in there. When the owner arrived, the hunter was gone, but none the wiser he grabbed the coat thinking nothing of it and went back home. We had tracked the owner as a distraction. We underestimated him, I said, staring distantly into the trees, and we paid for it. The SUV pulled into the driveway of the now charred police station. It was followed by the other three vehicles. As we stepped closer to the ruins of the cabin, a single white square caught my eye. I walked up to it and picked it up and brushed away the soot. And Thomas wheeled my grandfather forward. The three of us and the police looked at the paper, the very same newspaper that had reported the warehouse explosion, taken from my grandparents' house and placed here at the scene. The ink had leaked and dried, like faded charcoal tears on the parchment. My grandfather sighed. I know where to go. The drive was a long one down the coastal highway. Jagged snowy peaks peered over the vast expanse of green vegetation on Black Rock. The tall pine trees of the forest near our hometown grew sparser and sparser until they were completely gone. As the salty waves abatted the rocky cliffs near us, Thomas' grandpa and I discussed the situation. And grandpa explained to us that the hunter wanted to face off at the site of the explosion that had started it all. It was a pair of warehouses on a lot near the coast. The plot of land the warehouses were built on was hidden below the cliffs that the long highway expanded over. It was built there to be hidden in plain sight. Most wouldn't see it. It would be tucked beneath the rocky cliffs as they drove by. Those that did see it wouldn't think anything of it. That is where the Russians had met Grandpa to store and sell the cargo to cross through the Bering Sea. We had almost missed the warehouses, but Grandpa never forgot the scenery. Although there was little to work with, he knew. We stood on the cliff overlooking the remains of the charred and abandoned warehouse. Next to it was a still intact, but no less abandoned copy. As I stared down on it, I wondered if the hunter was inside, if he was waiting for us to enter, or if he waited somewhere on the outskirts. He had no woods to hide in this time. The black pickup truck was alone in the gravel parking lot. Bullet holes marked the metal body. Metals from the firefight the night before. Or was it earlier this morning? I couldn't be sure. As we looked down over the lot and over the chilly sea, Thomas asked the obvious question, the one that was all on our minds. What if he just blows it up? What if he just wants revenge for last time? My grandfather sat in his chair overlooking the warehouse. He probably wants to. He means to take my family from me before finishing the job. That's why he shot your grandmother. He could have easily taken me, but instead, he turned the gun on the love of my life and tried to snuff her out. His rough and wrinkled fingers dug into the arms of his chair, a subtle sign of rage in his otherwise stoic demeanor. That's why we can't have you two following me in. Not only is it stupid, it's probably exactly what he wants. Thomas and I argued, but Cartwright took Grandpa's side. He said it would be foolish for anybody to go in when we could wait him out. We don't want to take unnecessary risks, Cartwright said. He'll have to come out eventually. We'll surround the warehouse and wait. We can't. That warehouse is still full of canned food and other non-perishables, my grandfather explained. It's probably been his base of operations. With this new information, we decided to set up defensive positions. Henton and Serrano remained on the cliff, one covering the back and one covering the front. They would have bird's eye views to overlook the lot. Grandpa showed Cartwright a way down with the van. He took us with, but we remained in the van, ready to make an escape if necessary. And that's what we told him at least. Are we just going to watch? Thomas asked me as our grandfather wheeled himself ever closer to the metal-encased pole barn. Cartwright followed behind. 
We told Grandpa that we would stay out of harm's reach. As my grandfather looked over his shoulder at us in the distance and then disappeared into the warehouse, I said, It doesn't mean we will, though. I grabbed my gun and Thomas did the same. As the doors to the van closed, I told him that we would look for an entrance in the back and cut the man in the mask off if necessary. With a light jog, we scampered across the lot to the metal wall of the warehouse. We justified with each other that it made no sense to not use every person available. The two troopers had sight, but what if they missed? You think it's unlocked? I whispered to Thomas while gesturing at a set of graded steps that led up to a door on the back of the metal shed. He was staring at the charred skeleton of the twin warehouse that was destroyed so many years ago. Only one way to find out, he said. Up the steps into the red painted door we snuck. As we moved, we heard the faint sound of the overhead door my grandfather had gone into closing with considerable squeaking from its age. I asked what Thomas could see through the small square window in the center of the heavy metal door. He told me that it was nothing but darkness. And tentatively, he tried the handle and slowly it turned. The inside of the building was dark with only faint rays of light coming from cracks in the roof, doors or walls. The singular room of the warehouses was filled with rows of metal shelving, holding pallets of canned goods and several appliances. The catwalk that our door led into circled the whole warehouse, a perfect inner vantage point. Why did he pick a spot so easy for us to get an advantage in? I asked. He seems to care more about the story of it all, Thomas replied. If he just wanted us dead with no fuss, we wouldn't have made it past elementary school. We stepped in carefully and quietly. Although we wanted to remain up top to keep a strong position against the hunter, we could see very little. From some location in the echoing warehouse, we could hear a conversation between two men speaking in Russian. Well, he's not dead yet, I thought. For a moment, we only listened to the distant conversation before I told Thomas through the quietest whisper that I could manage that I wanted to get closer in case he needed help. He argued with me immediately. He said that we were as close as we needed to be without risking being seen. I heeded his advice only momentarily before I began to descend on the steps. I'm not following you, he said quietly. Good, look for a better vantage point. Through dusty, mildewed rows of crates and pallets I snuck, slowly and thoughtfully so that my steps would not give me away. I crept closer to the sound of conversation. I wondered why I could not hear the voice of the old trooper when I felt a pair of hands grab me and cover my mouth. You're not sticking to the plan, Cartwright whispered furiously. He slowly let go of me and non-verbally directed my attention to something. I saw the jumbled mess of homemade explosives on one of the steel supports of the building. How many? I mouthed more than spoke. He held up seven fingers and gestured for seven different spots. Can we disarm them? Cartwright did not answer immediately. Then he asked me if it was worth the risk. I shrugged and whispered back. It's either get blown up now or get blown up later. We could try and get close to him, take him out with a headshot. And if he hears us coming and decides to self-destruct, let's take our chances with the bombs first. Tom's on the catwalk, maybe he'll find a shot. But if not, our best bet is getting these things out of commission. Cartwright nodded, though he didn't look entirely pleased. I understood the hesitation. I wasn't entirely on board with the plan either, but at least was a plan and not a Hail Mary. Then, as I approached the mess of explosives and wires, pocket knife out and ready, I wondered if this wasn't also just a different form of a Hail Mary. I'm not very religious, but I can say without shame that I prayed before I cut the wire. Slowly, the blade dug into the rubber. Slowly, I pushed deeper, waiting for the inevitable end of my life. As my blade cut completely through, my heart stopped momentarily. But when no explosion came, I relaxed. Now just do it six more times, I whispered. Cartwright took his own pocket knife out and went around disarming others. Just after I had cut through my second wire, 
I heard the conversation between my grandfather and the hunter get louder and angrier. And then I heard a commotion and a thud. My grandfather yelled, Do it then! Without thinking, I immediately moved towards the noise with my gun drawn. I got to a part of the warehouse where the shelving stopped and saw my grandfather sprawled on the dirty concrete floor. He looked up at me in shock. No, you weren't supposed to be here. And then the loud crack of a gun went off. Thomas, from his position on the catwalk, had fired at the hunter who stood just behind me. I stared at the man in his mask. He held his arm as blood spilled from it. I knew that he wasn't invincible, and this confirmed it. My childhood fears fell away as I swung the butt of my rifle at his head, and I knocked him backward. Onto the ground he fell and I aimed my rifle at him. Just briefly I heard him laugh. And then the whole warehouse collapsed. Sheet metal and supports collapsed down on us. Shelves and their contents spilled under the weight. I heard nothing but a noise so loud that it deafened me. I coughed up dust now pinned prone to the ground. I reconnected to reality with nothing but ringing in my ears and a sharp pain in my leg. As the ringing faded and more of the world became clear again, I heard several competing shouts. I heard my grandfather crying and begging for us to be okay. I heard Thomas far off in the distance calling out to us. Then as I saw the large frame of the hunter making his way through the rubble towards me, I heard the bellow of Officer Cartwright tackling him to the ground. My grandfather called my name and I saw him dragging himself towards me. Can you get up? He asked his cart right and the hunter wrestled. My leg, my leg is pinned. He pushed aside shattered planks of wood and lifted sheets of metal to get closer. He embraced me for a moment. I felt the tears from his eyes wash the dust from my cheeks. He told me that he would get me free. Then he found a metal rod and pried the support beam which pinned me up just enough for me to slide it out. I won't be able to walk, I said. Then crawl out, get out of here. Not without taking down that guy. He played his trick, now he's vulnerable, I mean we all survived. And then I heard another distinctive blast that could have been a gunshot. I pulled myself up onto a split crate of VHS tapes to see through the floating dust and rays of sunlight through the collapsed roof. I saw Cartwright's body on the ground. He had been shot in the upper chest, or was it the neck? He held his collar tightly and could not speak. Blood spilled through his fingers. And then the hunter turned to see me. Only then did I realize that I had no gun. It had been lost in the explosion. The hunter lifted his own pistol and aimed it at me. I looked down the black barrel of the gun that would take my life, but the shot missed. It missed because at the last second the hunter was thrown off by an old man biting down hard into his leg. My grandfather had saved my life. The hunter did not appreciate it. He kicked my grandfather hard in the face, surely breaking his nose, and then he turned his attention back to me. He threw his gun aside as he approached me. As I watched the haunting image of the figure masked behind a wooden facade, my entire body wanted to freeze. I knew that I could not. I pulled my pocket knife out, now my only weapon. As if to challenge me, the man in the wooden mask pulled out a blade of the size of my forearm. Ducking under beams and crawling over boxes, he moved towards me. His sinister eyes never moved from mine and then I felt his massive hand grab onto my throat. He began to choke me to see the life drain from my face. I slashed away at his torso, but my minuscule blade couldn't even puncture his coat. Black spots filled my vision. I became lightheaded and only barely heard laughing. Laughing cut short by the sudden sound of chains and then. His grip loosened and then fully fell off my throat. I gasped for air and saw my grandfather. For the first time in a long time, I saw him standing completely upright and from his own volition. I saw the pain in his eyes as he wrestled the life from the hunter. I saw a rusty chain just below the wooden mask. It caught the gray yarn beard in its links. The man in the wooden mask stabbed my grandfather repeatedly in the side, trying desperately to loosen his grip. 
but as they both fell to the ground, my grandfather refused to let his hold go. The man in the wooden mask stared at me through the holes in the carved baggy eyes. For the first time, I saw fear in the opposite direction. As I pulled my body through the debris, I realized that neither of them would survive. My grandpa could not last the many stabs to his body. The hunter violently fought until at last, the swinging blade slowed in tempo and the knife fell to the ground. His last words were nothing more than gargled a gasp for air, so similar to what I had heard on the film as a child. Finally, I pulled myself over the crate of tapes, plastic breaking underneath me to get to the two. Thomas called in the background. I heard him ripping metal and debris away, desperately looking for a path in. Together, we threw the hunter's lifeless corpse aside. My grandfather was still alive, but not for long. Thomas grabbed onto me. We both held tightly onto one of the old man's hands. He did not break his gaze from us. I forgive you, I said. It wasn't your fault. The faintest smile grew on his lips. He mouthed a final goodbye to us. And then he was gone. Cartwright and my grandmother attended the funeral. Both of them had pulled through, but only barely. The two officers and Thomas helped Cartwright and then me to the cars where we drove at ludicrous speeds back to town. We had to leave the two bodies there the hunters and my grandfathers. I refused to go with them until they came back. I stayed in the rubble of the warehouse for a long time just staring at the bodies. Eventually, I pulled the mask away from the man who had haunted me my whole life, the man who had taken my grandfather from me. He looked like anyone else, no defining features, completely ordinary. The image of his face remained with me throughout the next couple of days. Thomas and Isabel worked with Grandma to organize the funeral. They called up distant family to visit. I was no help. I spent all my time staring off into the woods of Grandma's yard. I sat in a wheelchair due to my broken leg. I didn't need it, but I had asked for it. The day of the funeral, I arrived to the small graveyard in the forest before all of the other guests. All save for one. As I rolled my chair down the main path, I saw Cartwright in the distance. He looked at me as I made my way up to him. He stood in front of the graves of a husband and wife. He explained that he just wanted to let them know that he finally got the guy. And Grandma acted stoic throughout the event, but I knew she was broken inside. I could tell because I was too. After the funeral, her and I remained longer than anyone else. We talked for a while, but we were silent for longer. Eventually, as dusk fell on the cemetery, she placed a hand on my shoulder and said, I'm gonna drive back home and make some supper. You're gonna have to have your time alone and then you'll come and eat with your family. She kissed me on the forehead and was gone. I didn't say anything even as the sunlight fully slipped away. I simply pulled out the wooden mask from my bag and placed it beside Grandpa's headstone. I rolled my chair away, leaving the wooden mask arrayed as one final gift to my grandfather. I don't know if I actually forgive him or not. I wanted him to die at peace. I wanted him to have some closure. Maybe one day I'll have the same. All I know now is that I have to continue living to try and earn the life that we had fought so hard to preserve. And though I may have some very rough years ahead of me, I try to look at the positive. Whatever these circumstances were, this man raised me. He made me into what I am. He looked after me. I may not have a good adult life, but I had a good childhood, and nothing can take that away from me.